So the next speaker of the session is uh, Paulo Faria Jr. from the University of Regensburg, and his talk uh, titled, is titled Proximity Effects in Excitons of Two-Dimensional Van der Waals Semiconductors. Can you hear me? Great. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. I have to say it's very nice to be back in Brazil. I've been away for two years or so, and it's good to be back home. <coughs> and uh, in this talk today, I would like to show you a bit of the research I have been involved uh, in my postdoc in Germany. Uh, but before I show you the research, let me just show you a little bit of the group. And uh, we are located in Germany, in the city of Regensburg, in the Spintronics Research Group of Professor Jaroslav Faben. And Regensburg is a sort of a small city, 150,000 people, and it's one hour from Munich. And two of the landmarks of the city, if you ever go there, there's a very old stone bridge. People claim it's the oldest stone bridge of the world. And there's also the St. Peter's Cathedral, those two big, uh, this big church here. And the University of Regensburg has this sort of style. We have a, there's a lake there. Uh, the style is very German, very symmetric. And uh, in the group, where? this is the most recent picture of the group taken February 2019 in the PhD defense of Tobias. In Germany, there is this uh, tradition of every time you finish your PhD, you make this hat and they take this very seriously. They gather a group of people that have been interacting with a guy throughout the PhD and put pictures here and there. And this is the symbol of the group. You see the spin up and down are related to the, uh, the church here. And these people that I named here in the picture uh, are the people that you're gonna see around here in the, in the conference if you stay for the three weeks. So Yaro is one of the organizers. He will arrive next week. Dennis is already here. You might see him there. Martin will arrive, I guess, tomorrow. And Martin Mitra, which is, uh, not in the group at the moment anymore. He already moved, but he will also be here on the third week. And in this talk today, uh, sorry, I would like to give you an overview of exciton physics, especially regarding how to compute them with this approach called the effective beta cell Peter equation. And I, we will apply this for 2D monolayers, in particular for phosphorine and transition metal dichalcogenides under strain. And then I will move to the proximity exchange part that I advertise in the title, which will be discussing the stacking of MOSC2 and WSC2 on chromium triiodide, this uh, material here on the right, and then MOS2 and WS2 on boron nitride on top of a ferromagnet, copper or nickel. So let me start, start giving some overview of the exciton physics, in case you're not familiar with. So in a simple picture, of excitons in solids, we can think that there is an electron and then there's a hole and they are interacting via Coulomb electrostatic potential. And this is a concept that have been uh, studied for a very long time. So Franco and Vanier have uh, introduced these concepts in the, in the 30s. And essentially the properties of the electrons and holes are uh, uh, ruled by the band structure. In a simple model, essentially we can just talk about the effective masses of the electron and the hole. The dielectric environment will also play a role on how these two particles are interacting. And what is more important is that exciton is an intrinsic many-body phenomenon, which means that this picture here that we have of conduction and valence band is not suitable anymore. We might look at excitons in, the, in this way. So we talk about excitation, so no exciton means a ground state. And particularly when we have the excitons, we create the states that are below the band gap energy. We typically call them uh, bound states. And this energy separation between the first bound state and the continuum, or which is the band gap, is what we call the binding energy. And as a signature of this uh, phenomena, if we look at the absorption, we will see something like this. In a dashed line here, I'll show you a single particle picture that we would obtain on this first uh, using this approach here. And on that solid line, I show you what you observe if you include the excitonic effects, which you actually what you see in the experiment for an absorption, for instance. You see a great peak in the beginning related to the first bound exciton. You can see other peaks related to other excitons, depending on the sensitivity of your measurement. And the binding energy is essentially this separation between the peak and this deep that goes to the continuum 
region. Um, let's look at what is the main difference between a 3D and 2D exciton from a textbook approach. In textbook approach, I mean it's a parabolic band, so essentially effective masses is what, is what we need. Uh, let's assume a Coulomb potential, just one over R. And this essentially leads to the hydrogen atom problem. Here I show you the energies of the first exciton state, which we try to connect to the hydrogen, so we call it 1S. Uh, and this uh, uh, term in red here is essentially this binding energy. So from 2D, 3D to 2D, you would get a factor of 4. And this is what we would look, uh, we would see in the absorption. So 3D is essentially the figure I showed you before. In 2D, the dashed line is essentially just a constant if we look at single particle. And when we include excitonic effects, we get the peaks and so on. And uh, already from 3D to, T to 2D, we see this increase of a factor of four in the, effective in the, in the binding energy. But if we look at the real materials, essentially what's happening is in the 3D materials, typically 3.5s, we have a very strong dielectric screen. So the epsilon, the, the dielectric constant, is very large. And we have a small binding energy of roughly uh, five milli electron volts. In 2D materials, this condition of the dielectric constant is lifted. So the di effective dielectric constant is reduced. And we can imagine that it's because now the, the, the field lines are going outside of the material. And you can reach binding energies of 500 milli electron volts, which is very interesting because room temperature is essentially 25 milli electron volts energy range. So you can study exciton physics at room temperature into the material. That is one of the most attractive things that people are looking for in these materials. Uh, here are some examples of real experimental data where you can see the excitonic signature. So here on the left side, I show you the bulk gallium arsenide zinc blend. And on the, on the right side, I show you indium wurzite nanowires, which are very, uh, have a very large diameter. So this is essentially a bulk as well. If you have near room temperature, so you essentially don't have the peak at all, you can see here 300 Kelvin to 294 Kelvin. When you decrease the temperature, for instance, 21 Kelvin, you see the first peak. And here also you see the exciton peaks. Uh, this ABC in the, in the root side is related to the different energy bands. In 2D materials, for instance, this on the left is the uh, experimental demonstration that in MOS2, when you go to the one layer limit, you have a direct band gap semiconductor. At 300 Kelvin, you already see these two peaks. Those are the two exciton signatures. And on, this, on the right side, there is another experiment that if you, do, uh, uh, if you have some very precise measurements, for instance, this reflectance contrast, uh, analyzing the derivative, you can get this hydrogenic series of the excitons. So 1s, 2s, 3s, and so on. And as a theorist, you would like to have a, a, a tool to try to compute this and connect to the experiment. And for the purpose of this talk, and what is with, with, with which is what we are using in those uh, uh, projects, is the so-called beta Pitt equation. And uh, we are restricting ourselves at the moment for, di uh, for direct excitons, so our transitions that conserve wave vector, and zero temperature. So we're not including temperature effects. And this equation here, is essentially an eigenvalue problem. So we have here the diagonal, the single particle energies, and, and off diagonal here, this D and X are direct and exchange terms. And in the end, when you diagonalize this, you will get the exciton energies, this omega N, and you get the exciton envelope function, this ACVK for each of the exciton. The direct term is given like this. It depends on the Coulomb potential. And the exchange term, exchange term is essentially we reverse the sign and exchange x and xy prime. And I put it here in red because we are not including this term due to some of the approximations. And also many people are also not doing that. So you there will be no exchange interaction in the calculations that we're doing. But this doesn't, doesn't change the physics that we are looking at. And the two main ingredients for this equation that you need to provide as an input is are the single particle spectra, conduction and valence band, uh, uh, band structure and, and, and wave functions and also the bare Coulomb potential. So let me show you what, is, what it is that we are using for this uh, single particle and the bare Coulomb potential, or how to compute them. For the single particle spectra, what we are essentially using is, we first perform some first principle calculations, 
which would provide the complete band structure of the system. But we are not interested in everything that is happening in the band structure. We are actually interested in the physics around the band edge. So it, it is convenient to introduce some effective modeling to this band structure, to describe this region in the case space that, we, that is the physics that we are looking for. And for this effective modeling, essentially, there are two approaches that we have been using, either the k.p method or the time binding. This is just a pictorial way to uh, understand what's happening between these two approaches. For instance, in the k.p method, we talk about the, the blob functions at some specific k point, so they spread all over the unit cell of your crystal. For the time binding, we usually talk about orbitals or things that are localized and look like orbitals. And when these two uh, things are interacting, the, the blob functions or the orbitals, we have the, for the k.p approach, we call it k.p parameters. This is what appears in our Hamiltonian. And for the time binding, we usually call them hopping parameters. But regardless of, this, uh, 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 of the approach that you pick for the effective modeling, one thing that they have in common is that you need to perform some symmetry analysis to describe which are the allowed couplings and which are not the allowed couplings. And we uh, already had some group theory uh, tutorial yesterday. So when we get zero, it's really zero. Uh, and usually, when you want to uh, when you want this Hamiltonian to behave as the band structure that you're starting with, it is convenient to, s to do a fitting procedure. And depending on the size of the Hamiltonian and what are the properties that you want to describe, this would be a numerical uh, 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 thing that you have to do. For the bare Coulomb potential, essentially what you need to do is solve the Poisson equation for the dielectric environment that you are you're considering. So for 2D, I will focus here on 2D. Uh, if you solve the Poisson equation in 2D, you would get something that is log 1 over r, and in k space is 1 over k squared. So k space is very convenient because that's actually, if you're talking about the interaction between different k points, this is what appears directly in the Hamiltonian of the, of the, of the exciton. But people also usually say, okay, we can do the uh, Coulomb potential in 2D, which is essentially kicking out the Z component of the 1 over R Hamiltonian, and then you get something like this. And when you take the, the Fourier transform, you get 1 over K dependence. But actually, the most convenient and most uh, one of the most reliable potentials for the if we're talking about 2D materials is the so-called ritova keldish potential, and which is something that people have done in the past for quantum wells, uh, and it works very well for 2D materials. And the reason is you have a 2D material, and it's sandwiched by a top and a bottom dielectric with di different dielectric constants. So you take this dielectric profile, plug into the Poisson equation, and you assume this limit that KD is much smaller than one. So you have a very thin layer encapsulated by some dielectric materials that are very big. If you do that, you find this uh, functional form in K space. It depends on one over K and one over K squared. Very similar somehow as a superposition of the, sol the real solution in 2D in the hydrogen uh, in the Coulomb potential in 2D when you kick out the Z component. If you take the Fourier transform, you get this uh, a form in real space, and uh, this H0 and Y0 are the Struve and the Bessel function. And essentially, the two parameters that uh, describe your potential is the dielectric surrounding. You can know the dielectric constant of your materials. That's all you need to know. And the screening length, which is some property of the material that you're talking about. And the screening length is related to the dielectric constant of the material itself. And let me show you some simple cases of the beta salpit equation to so you can see how the calculations are performed and what, it, what are the things that we look that we are looking for when we try to, for instance, there is something that we need to do is convergence. I will show you how this looks like. So parabolic band models, as I mentioned before, is something that just depends on the effective mass, is a k squared uh, dispersion. Uh, for this purpose, I will assume an isotropic Coulomb potential, so I will get to the hydrogen problem. Uh, as I showed you before, this is with the, the, the binding energy, the, the exciton levels of the bound excitons will follow the hydrogen atom in 3D and 2D. And if we plug some values for, for numerical calculations, for instance, pick an electron mass of 0 0.1 and a whole mass of 0 0.4, and let's just pick a uh, dielectric constant of 10. So we get that the, the first exciton binding energy in 2D is four times bigger than the exciton binding energy in 3D, as I showed you before. And for the numerics, uh, what we need to be careful is that we're going to discretize our case space in the limit that we first need to check how large we, we can consider this. 
we have to, to consider that there are points inside, so how, how many points do we need? And then once we, we, once we do this, we direct diagonalize the equation. So this is, these are the typical uh, pictures that we look for when we diagonalize the beta sulpita equation. Here the color code uh, gives you the size of the k space that we are considering. And uh, this nk is the number of k points in each direction, so positive direction. So in total, we have 2 times nk plus 1 to the power of 3 because we are in 3D. And we can look at how the energy, the binding energy, evolves as a function of k, or we can look at how the energy evolves as a function of one, o 1 over number of points. And this one is very interesting because it sort of looks like a line here. So from here, you can just do a linear extrapolation, and you get the binding energy. And the binding energy depends on the k limit, the size of your k space. So the exciton wave function wants to live in a space. And if, you, if your space is too small, then you're constricting your exciton wave function. So you have to put some sort of space so the exciton wave function can relax and go to zero, look like to look like an s orbital, for instance, for this exciton that we are looking for. And here on the right side is just a zoom that uh, for the 0 0.5 to 0 0.1. And so the American calculations are uh, reaching the value of the, of the analytical calculation which is already enough to, to discuss the physics of the excitons. Uh, one thing that we can do is to improve this convergence. So linear extrapolation is not very nice if you want to do, for instance, absorption. So what you can do is you have your large mesh grid, this black point here, and you dis define a small mesh that surrounds this k-point. And what you do is you average the Coulomb potential over all these uh, orange points here. And this uh, improves your, 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 uh, your result. For instance, I'm fixing the k limit at 0 0.8 over nanometer here. And this NW is the number of k points of this small grid. So this curve here is essentially the one of the curves of the previ previous figure. So if you take a reasonable um, um, a value of number of k points and you start increasing this value of the W mesh, the binding energy goes closer to what you're looking for. This uh, plane here is essentially the, the theoretical binding energy. And this is uh, uh, it's better to see this in a, in, a, in a color plot. So for instance, increasing the k-point and then increasing the, k the W mesh, you go from 7 milli electron volts, quite far away from what you would like to have, to something that is now almost minus 11 electron volts, which is almost the binding energy that you would expect. And for this, you don't need any linear extrapolation. This is actually the approach that we use to compute the absorption. So every absorption that I show you for an exciton is this interplay of these two grids that we have used. For 2D, now I will just show a, a, a little bit of what happens in 2D. First of all, the region of space that you need for 2D is larger than 3D. So the axons are more spread in 2D in the K space. And you, we can do the same analysis as increasing the K limit and checking how the binding energy converges. And this was R0 equals 0. Now we start increasing this uh, screening length of the 2D material. And what happens is the binding energy increases. So which means that if you use the ritova keldish potential, it deviates from the hydrogen uh, potential. And this, is, this was actually seen in experiments for WSE2. Uh, this is the 2D hydrogen model here in solid lines. Theory means using this ritova keldish potential, which means including some screening length for your material. Uh, which means that your effective potential is now less deep than the 2D hydrogen atom. And this matches the hydrogen series, they call it non Rydberg series now because it's not the hydrogen atom, matches quite well what they see in the experiments. Uh, before I move to 2D, let me just give you some realistic example in 3D that we have done recently for indium phosphide Wurzine nanowires. They have ver very large diameter, so essentially they behave as bulk. Uh, we started working with indium phosphide a few years ago, and we were just interested in spin splitting effects. And essentially, we would like to describe this by an effective Hamiltonian. So here in this figure, this is the Wurzite structure, this hexagonal arrangement. We, we, we devi devised an effective Hamiltonian that describes the ab initio calculations. And here we have bend gap corrections and everything. And for the, at the time, it was uh, in good agreement with what the experiments were giving to the band gap and splittings here. Then later we started, uh, we got interested in, in excitons and uh, we computed using this effective Hamiltonian the exciton binding energy for the indium phosphide wood side. And we find uh, 6.9 milli electron volts. So roughly the order of five, as I mentioned before, because we are in 3D, very strong uh, screening effects. 
experimentally, uh, in this study here, they were able to estimate by using the effective exciton mass that they measure directly, they can estimate 6.4 milli electron volts. So our calculations are in very good agreement with what they obtained. And another interesting thing we did in this project is we are looking at the excitons under magnetic field. And for that, we were using the Landau levels as the single particle approach to, your, to our beta cell PT equation. And here, I show you the plots of, this is the experimental data. You take the PL peak, and you take the difference, you take the Zeeman splitting, and this is what is plotted here. In the dashed line is the single particle approach, no exciton. And in, in, in solid line is the exciton. So our calculations without any free parameters match the experiment uh, uh, very well. And as a follow-up of this study, we also showed that this nonlinear feature observed if you the magnetic field is aligned with the non wire axis is actually very general. And we showed that not only numerically, but also from an effective model analytically, that the three five root side materials can uh, 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 behave uh, in this way with a nonlinear Zeeman splitting. Uh, so let's now move to the 2D monolayers first before going to the proximity effects. Uh, we have seen in the, in the conference so far that there are uh, many interesting properties of these 2D materials, and I guess it's safe to say nowadays that whatever feature you have in 3D, you, m you can find it in 2D as well. And for example, insulator we already have in 2D, semiconductors, half metals, semi-metals, metals, superconductors. In this list, it's also missing ferromagnets. There are also ferromagnets, 2D material ferromagnets. Regarding band gaps, uh, the 2D materials nowadays can spam a large energy as much as the, three, the, the conventional three, three, three D materials that we have so far. So black phosphorus here is one that bridges a very large energy range if you change the number of layers, for instance. And uh, here's another picture discussing uh, uh, the energy range of the, the materials. And I guess these are the most famous materials. We hear about them last week and this week as well. Boronitride, uh, TMDCs, phosphorine or black phosphorus and graphene as well. And essentially what I will discuss today is related to black phosphorus and TMDC materials. So let's start first with phosphorine. And we were actually motivated to study phosphorine from a spintronics perspective. In 2016, in the group of Professor Yaroslav Fabian, they have studied the spin relaxation mechanisms in phosphorine, which is an anisotropic crystals, an isotropic crystal. And essentially they show that if the spins are in plane along zigzag or armchair direction, they have very different uh, spin relaxation rates. But if you take the spin out of plane, it's also a different uh, uh, spin relaxation rate. And this is true not only for intrinsic mechanisms, as the Elliot Yafet, but also for extrinsic mechanisms for diachron opera, if they have an external electric field applied to the sample, which is very common in experiments. And using this approach, they uh, worked together with the group of Professor uh, Barbaros, Ozumas for the Singa from Singapore, and they were able to, st to study the behavior of the spin valve operation using phosphorine. And what they found experimentally is that the, the their device at two th 250 Kelvin has a spin relaxation time of two nanoseconds, almost uh, comparable to graphene at 300 Kelvin, for instance. So they are trying to use phosphorine as a, another material to combine with graphene for spintronics applications. There are also many reports about transport in phosphorine, not only for holes, but also for electrons. Here I just show you a few of them. And in these uh, experiments, one thing that they do is they apply external magnetic field, which means that they can extract the G factor out of phosphorine. And this is one of the things that we are interested about. If we look at the conventional K.P approach, this, this would be the equation that you will use to compute a G factor if you have an effective Hamiltonian. It looks very easy. You just need to know these couplings between the bands, and you plug it there, and you get an equation for your G factor, put the numbers, and you get a value. But when we looked at phosphorine, what happened is that the spy operator here is essentially the velocity operator, which includes spin orbit coupling. For phosphorine, along armchair direction, you have only a coupling via this linear momentum. But in the zigzag direction, this is zero. You only have the contribution of spin orbit coupling. And our task was, what is the value of the intrinsic G factor in monolayer phosphorine? Can we compute this value of the spin orb coupling and try to give a value of this G 
refactor in Fossil Rain to help the experiments. One of these papers states clearly that more theory is needed for this uh, material. So this motivated us. And the same approach as I mentioned for annual phosphide, uh, for phosphorine, we started with the ab initio band structure calculation here in, in, uh, in uh, dashed gray line. And we pro pro proposed different models, including different bands and all these couplings of uh, spin orbit coupling and linear momentum that I showed you before. Overall, they all match the, the, the ab initio band structure. Uh, uh, given their limitations, for instance, some of the models are not able to describe the effective mass variation very close to gamma point. It's just a straight line. But still, they provide good results for the excellence that I, as I will show you later. And regarding those two couplings, the linear momentum and the spin orbit coupling, these are the values that we found, uh, estimating from ab initio and then performing a, a fitting on top of that. So P is on the order of five electron volt angstroms, and alpha is two order of magnitude smaller. At this point, we are not able to decide if, the is if this parameter was positive or negative. And when we compute G factors, this is what we found. The correction is on the order of 0.03, to the bare electron G factor. This is if we take positive sign and negative sign. If you look at experiments, in valence band, people have been measuring something like this from those uh, uh, reference that I, I showed you in the previous slide, around two, but some variation here. For conduction band, they found this top limit of 2.5. And when we look at the other theoretical attempts in the literature, there's this paper from 2017 where they did not calculate it alpha directly from some ab initio calculation or something like that, but they try to estimate given some experimental data, which I don't recall exactly what experimental data they were using. And they found this alpha of 0 0.45, one, or one order of magnitude bigger than what we could calculate. During our, uh, uh, when our paper was in the proofs, we found out that there was another paper in the archive recently posted that this guy also calculated alpha from ab initio approach, but his ab initio doesn't have gap correction, so we might expect some variation. However, the order of magnitude is consistent with what we found. And one order of magnitude smaller with this previous available value here. So we can say with a certain degree of uh, safety that if we have some deviations uh, from the G factor of almost two in the experiments, then essentially this is not, this doesn't come from an intrinsic feature of phosphorine, but actually due to electron electron interaction, many body effects, because we are charging this material, there are many uh, carriers there, and this renormalizes the G factor. So it's important to separate the contributions, because otherwise if you try to compare, you can overestimate the parameters, and you get the wrong physics out of it. It's not a single particle physics, a many body physics, that gives you large values of G factor in phosphorine. Now let's go to the axons in phosphorine. Here I'll show you the binding energies and the diameter of the axon wave function in the two directions, in the two uh, different axes in phosphorine, using the three different effective methods that we have devised uh, before. We if we compare the binding energy to the literature, uh, our values are here for uh, freestanding uh, phosphorine on top of silicon dioxide and phosphorine encapsulated by boron nitride. Uh, our values are in good agreement, and I like to point out that within this range here, there are many, many different approaches. Fully ab initio approaches, experimental estimations, uh, effective models that only rely on the effective mass. All the values lie within this range, and so our values do the same. Which means that our models provide the right, uh, the right exciton physics for phosphorine. And to see how the, the, the diameter develops, it's convenient to show you the envelope function of the axiton, which is this one over here. So here in this line, I show you the vacuum, uh, the wave the axiton wave function in vacuum, freestanding, in real space, here, sorry, reciprocal space, here in real space, and here in the, in the, in the bottom part, I show you encapsulated by boronitride. So the first thing to notice is that if you have an exciton that is extended in k-space, it squeezes in real space. And the other way around, if you have an exciton that is confined in k-space, you would have an extended exciton in, in real space. And the dielectric environment changes the exciton wave function a little bit. So localized exitons in k-space are extended exitons in real space and vice versa. And from the wave functions here, we take the full width of half maximum, and then we can extract the diameter. And the diameter seems to be evolving quite linear as we increase the dielectric constant. 
So let's now move from phosphorine to transition metal dichalcogenides, and particularly in this project, we are interested in how the optical properties or other intrinsic properties evolve in strain samples. So we heard in the previous talk a few, a few approaches how to strain this material. In this particular uh, 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 reference here, they place a TMDC on a sort of cavity filled with gas, and by changing the pressure of this gas, you could float or defloat this phosphorine. So you get this kind of bubble. So before you move to the next topic, um, can you tell us uh, why you think that the, uh, the, uh, the many body contributions are important in that uh, alpha that you mentioned before? Mm -hmm. um, essentially, phosphorus is a very light material, so we would not expect to have a very large contribution from, in com from intrinsic properties. And therefore, what they measure means some sort of contribution of exchange effect of the carriers that makes the Zeeman splitting larger. In that same uh, paper of, the, of those guys that found the 0 0.5, they have showed you that if you include exchange in this many body approach, then you can modify your G factor for, or for around the same, the same value. So exchange is what cha uh, changes your Zeeman splitting. Those were using an effective model, so they in introduced the spin orb coupling in the zigzag direction and they didn't perform any DFT to extract, so they tried to combine this with some experimental data they had available. So that's why they found those, that value that was quite large. So they were comparing a single particle feature with something experimental that has many body effects. Exactly. Yeah. Then you need to some additional theory to provide what is the, at least the order of magnitude. And if you don't have that, then essentially you fit a single particle to the, to, the, to, the, to the experimental data and you are overestimating your parameter because there are contributions that shouldn't be there. So when you apply strain to a uh, 2D material, you change its properties, its intrinsic, intrinsic properties. And here I show you this PL, how it evolves when you apply this uh, biaxial strain to the material in this sort of bubble shape. <laughs> One nice thing about strain that people are trying to use is that it spatially localizes the excitons. So look at here at this MOS2 uh, uh, monolayer. It has some wrinkles on it. And when they shine light in the non-wrinkled part, the excitons move to the wrinkled part and then recombine. And people are trying to use this to do some uh, uh, spatially localization and, 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 and uh, single photo emitters. And one thing that is very surprising and interesting in these materials is that they can sustain a very large amount of strain. So there are some reports that say they can go up to 10% of strain without breaking the sample. This for a quantum well material would be completely crazy to consider. Up to 1% is already large enough and you would introduce many defects. So these 2D materials are very versatile in this way. And from a theoretical perspective, we need to think about strain because when we are doing a calculation, a DFT calculation, you need to have a commensurate supercell, so periodic boundary conditions. And usually different materials have different lattice constants. So for instance, here I show you this example of a recent study in, 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 in Yaro's group that they were placing graphene on top of TMDC. So if you choose a four by four graphene supercell and you want to place it on top of a three by three TMDC supercell, and you assume that the graphene will be relaxed, and the, the strain part will come from the TMDC, then essentially you will need to apply those type of strains. So up to 1.5 for MOSC2 and up to 4% here for the, the tellurium-based TMDCs. So that's something that we you need to consider when you're doing van der Waals lateral structures. If you don't consider that, then your supercell might be too large and so on. And uh, motivated by that, we started looking at what would change in the TMDC if we start by actually straining uh, uh, the material. So we change the lattice parameter A, and then other things will change. So DXX, the distance between the two uh, dichalcogen atoms. DMX, here I show you a schematic band structure at around the band gap. There will be the spin orb splitting in valence band, lambda V, lambda C, and delta is sort of the band gap. And the Fermi velocity is something that describes the effective mass here. 
So when you strain the material, all this would change, and all this contributes to most of the physics that you are looking for. So for instance, here I show you the example of WSC2. We did for other materials, but they all look sort of the same with different uh, quantitative uh, values. And we also changed the amount of, the, the, the contribution of spin orbit coupling. So turning off the spin orbit from the dichalcogen atom. Uh, for the band gap, the spin orbit coupling uh, contributes up to tens of milli electron volts. The Fermi velocity changes sort of this nonlinear way. Here are the two uh, lattice parameters, dxx and dmx. The spin orbit splitting in the conduction band, there's also some difference if you include the spin orbit coupling in the two atoms. They follow this uh, nonlinear behavior. And for the valence band, you see the largest contribution of this, uh, 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 the spin orbit coupling of the two atoms. And one thing that was striking us was that, first of all, when we look at all this data, the sum of these parameters are nonlinear. For instance, lambda c, lambda v, and vf. And all this contributes to the exciton, uh, to the exciton levels. And therefore, how do they really affect the excitonic levels? So we take those uh, parameters, fit it to the ab initio data. We have in the, in the, in the, in the paper a, a table with all that that other people can also use. And for if we're looking at MO-based TMDCs or tungsten-based TMDCs, then essentially there's a reverse of the conduction band here. So they have different sign of this lambda c. The valence band looks quite similar. So here I show you the example of MOS2, the most studied TMDC, and WSC2, just to show you what happens if you have this reverse band. The solid lines are for bare samples, and the, the dashed lines are for encapsulated samples. So you also want to see how the dielectric environment would alter these properties. A and B excitons stem from different uh, 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 bands. So first valence to the first allowed conduction band, we would call A excitons. The, they would have the lowest energies. And the B excitons would be the additional peaks that you'd see, which would not be this uh, hydrogenic series. So for MO base, you see that you have an A exciton. The next peak is a B exciton. For tungsten base, you have A exciton, some other uh, types of A exitons, 2S. And then you have a B exciton. So they are interpenetrating. And it's difficult to analyze this figure here. So the figure of merit that people can really extract from the experiment is something that is called gauge factor, which tells us how the slope is varying with the amount of strain. So it it's given usually in milli electron volts per percentage of strain applied to the material. So here I show you some values that we have calculated. And here, a GW beta salpita equation calculation. So fully ab initio, in principle, you could claim that this is more precise than what have we have been doing. But if we look at the values, they are quite close, and they match quite well. And another thing is that if we have the, 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 the encapsulation with boron nitride, this gauge factor doesn't change so much. Three milli electron volts can be uh, 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 related to the experimental uncertainty. And actually, there are not many experiments about this. The people are, are straining these materials, but to really extract a gauge factor is not an easy task. And mostly you would find, for biaxial strain, uh, 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 apparently, you, see you would find many experiments for MOS2. And they would have values like this, minus 100, 105, minus 99, plus minus 6. So and minus 44, uh, 94, sorry. Which means that our calculations, without having gap corrections for this case, we are not including any gap correction, provides the right physics and even almost the same value as people are extracting from experiments. Uh, let us now move to the van der Waals heterostructures. When people started exfoliating and, ex and, and obtaining these different to the materials, they rushed to start putting them on top of each other. It seems to be a inherit property of the human being to have two things and want to combine them in some way. So they, they and then they, they call this a van der Waals heterostructure. So different 2D materials that would stack on top of each other via this van der Waals interaction. And then this gives a very rich playground because you can put them on top of each other, you can rotate, you can bend and so on and so forth. But one of the things that people talk about the most when you put two, two materials together is the so-called proximity effect, which means Imagine you're looking for at graphene, and the graphene is on top of something else. So you might ask, what is happening to graphene given that it's on top of something else? What alters the intrinsic properties of graphene? And there's this nice review of uh, uh, Professor Igor Zutik, wo which will be here on the third week. So you can ask him about proximity effects if you wish. 
just to give some example of, of how this proximity effect appears, uh, I'll give an example using the, 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 the studies in the Ados group. So for instance, this is graphene on top of TMDC. That's trained figure I showed before. So if you put graphene on top of TMDC, molybdenum, uh, molybdenum SC2, MOSC2, you get this sort of contribution, so you, you split all these Dirac cones. If you put it on tungsten, then you have this bending version. There's some topology associated to it, just because you change the material that you, you place graphene on top. Another example that was also being studied in, in, in the Yaros group is related to exchange effect. So this is a bilayer graphene on top of a ferromagnet, and what you see is that both valleys, now you break time reversal symmetry, and both valleys have the same spin polarization. And we are interested in this sort of thing. How, what happens to a TMDC when, you, when we put on top of a material that will induce some effective magnetization to the TMDC? In a monolayer TMDC, without being on top of anything, people find ex exciton G factors of around four. And at 10 tesla, this will be a 2.3 milli electron volt splitting. There are some recent experiments that place TMDC on top of aerobium sulfide, uh, uh, which is ferromagnet, and they see that if you compare without being on, the, on this magnetic substrate and putting on top of the substrate, you see this enhanced valley splitting. But actually what they wanted to do is, if you have a magnetic substrate, you would, wouldn't like to apply magnetic field. And theoretically, they, they uh, predicted that without any magnetic field, you would see a splitting of 10 milli electron volts. But when they look at experiment, they see it nearly zero. And the reason for that is related to the surface issues. When you put this uh, monolayer on top of something that is not by van der Waals in, uh, 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 interaction, you have problems like polycrystallinity, terminations, and so on. And all this uh, is detrimental to the effective uh, splitting that you would see in the TMDC, for instance. One way to circumvent this problem is to use an intrinsic van der Waals material, so an ultra-thin van der Waals ferromagnet. And people have showed that this material, chromium triiodide, behaves like that. So they place TMDC on top of chromium triiodide, and they show the PL here. At 65 Kelvin, they look nearly the same, but when they reduce the temperature to below this current temperature, they see a, a, a valley splitting of 3.5 milli electron volts. And this is roughly 13 Tesla if we compare with this property of the, of the G factor of, of a bare monolayer. Uh, yes. And this is without magnetic field. So that's, the, uh, that's what we wanted to do. You place the material on top of some ferromagnet and you get an effective magnetization to it without applying any magnetic field. So we were motivated by this and we started studying MOSC2 and WSC2 on top of this chromium triiodide. And this essentially summarizes what's happening in our structure. We found that this is a very short range proximity effect. Why is that? We place a TMDC on top of another TMDC. And the second TMDC doesn't feel that there is a chromium triiodide there. So no magnetization is uh, uh, transferred there. We placed another chromium triiodide below this one, either with the same spin alignment as the first layer or with antiferromagnet alignment. And it also doesn't change the amount of, uh, of, of, of splitting that the TMDC bands suffer. We also placed a boron nitride in between these layers, if you think about encapsulation of boron nitride. And the proximity exchange, this PE, decreases by two orders of magnitude, from milli electron volts to micro electron volts. So then, this is in re indeed a short range proximity effect. And this is an example of the band structure of MOSC2 on top of chromium triiodide. Uh, here we have no twist, no field, and there is spin orbit coupling. So you see here in the middle of the gap some chromium bands. And the role of these bands in the experiments, essentially they quench the contribution of the light polarization that is related to this spin. So this is one type of spin, and you would see a decrease of the amplitude. But the splitting, the valley splitting, would come essentially from the TMDC. And here we can see in the, a zoom, of the uh, of the energy f of the low energy at k and k prime, modeled by a tight binding Hamiltonian, and you see that this splitting is slightly different from this one, and this comes from the proximity uh, uh, exchange effect. And regardless of what you do, essentially we just twisted the two materials and we applied external electric field. We can just uh, 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 pick 
rhetorically just described like this. So you have kk prime points. We are aligning the valence band uh, to have the same energy. So everything is, we can just look at the conduction band. So by changing this thing, these things, twist and, and electric field, we would change how these two bands are aligned to each other. And then therefore we can change this valley splitting that can be probed by photoluminescence. And here are the exciton calculations for the absorption. I just give you here some examples of uh, external electric fields. And we can, in the whole absorption spectrum, we have A and B excitons, but essentially we're interested in the A exon. That's what would, that, would, that is what would be probed in the photoluminescence experiments. And by changing the electric field, which cha we change this splitting here between the two peaks. And if we twist, we also do that. So let's summarize all this in a single figure. By twisting MOSC2 from 0 to 30 degrees, we increase 3.4 times this valley splitting. If we twist WSC2 from 0 to 30 degrees, we increase 4.4 times this valley splitting. On top of that, we can apply the, el the electric field. These are the results for zero angle. And you can tune almost in a linear way this valley splitting. And for, cur for, for curiosity, we also plot it together with the single particle approach. So solid lines would be single particle, and the dashed lines would be the exciton. So single particle follows quite well this exciton, uh, the, the first exciton peak. So if you just do so want to do some raw calculation, just estimate how much is the valley splitting, you can just look at the single particle, and that will be fine to give you some order of magnitude. Uh, the other uh, study that we have that we have done in, uh, investigating proximity effects is MOS2 and WS2 now with a boron nitride before placing on the ferromagnet. And essentially, with this, we can sort of kill those problems with terminations and polycrystallinity that people have seen in the experiment. We are aware that by putting a boron nitride, we decrease the valley splitting that is uh, 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 transferred to the TMDC, but nevertheless, this would be a, 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 a more reliable way to detect experimentally. And also in this case, using the tight bind modeling, we see that TMDC bands are preserved with the inclusion of the proximity effect. It changes this splitting of uh, conduction and valence bands at different values in KK prime. And by calculating the absorption, we see something like this, similar to the previous figure I showed you. And by changing the material, copper to nickel or tungsten with copper and nickel, we have different exchange splittings for the different materials. Here, the largest value is attributed because there are some very strong hybridization between the TMDC and the copper for MOS2. So we get this very large value. Uh, before I finish, I would like to acknowledge the people that are uh, contributed to this work. It would not be possible without them. For 2D materials, Yaro, Marching Mitra, Marching Kurpas, and Klaus Zoner. Uh, for the Wurzstein nanowires, where we did the comparison with the experiment, Professor Antonio Polimeni from Rome, his uh, former PhD students, and Benny Scharf from the University of Würzburg. For the effective K.P modeling for indium phosphide, this I did during my PhD with Guilherme Cipai from the University of San Carlos. And I also acknowledge valuable discussions that I had with my office mate, Dennis, who is also here, Toby and, and Dennis Candido. And these people that are colored I are the people that you might see around here at the conference. So Dennis is already here, as I mentioned, and these guys will appear soon. And I also acknowledge the financial support. Now we have this uh, new SFB project in the, in the department in Regensburg that funds many people. But before that, I was funded by Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, so I would like to advertise a little bit of that. If you are finishing your PhD and want to do a postdoc in Germany, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation is a very nice uh, uh, funding agency that you can ask money. And also, if you, are, uh, if you already have your PhD and you also re uh, experience research, you can also apply for some funding for the Humboldt Foundation. And as a curiosity, since we are all physicists here, the first director of the Alexander von Humboldt after the Second World War was Werner Heisenberg. He's, he was director of the Humboldt Foundation for many years. I was there in the headquarters and I saw many books from Heisenberg and I was asking the people, why do you have so many books for Heisenberg? And they said, you know, he was the first director of our foundation for many years. So this was quite interesting. So I leave you here the summary of the talk with the topics that I showed you today. And thank you for your time. So we have time for questions. Okay. 
So this uh, last part where you showed that the single particle and the exciton energies agree, why is that? Because in principle you said there's a big difference, right? The binding energy is very strong. Yeah. So where is it that 